what republic and the territory? Hawaii. Hawaii, yeah. And oh, Fisk. He would best known for pushing what that hierarchy of race would be what justification for colonialism or imperialism. Yeah, that's social Darwinism. And perfect, perfect. Look good. Did we show you this? Did I show you this one? Yes. Did I show you this one? Okay, so Cuba and fighting for independence from Spain for a very long time. Remember, don't get it. The United States has always had kind of a special interest in Cuba. Remember the filibusters? Were these kind of freeloader, freeloaders, <laughs> freebooter who were going to overthrow governments in, in uh, Latin America and hopefully they can annex them as slave states? So, and it's 90 miles from the shore. Well, Jose Marti was a leader of Cuba Libre, and he very reluctantly accepted some American support in the 1890s, even though he thought if the United, the United States has wanted Cuba for a long time, they might not leave. There's, uh, in many ways, he's considered the father of modern Cuba. You know, the two big heroes are the, you find the most statues in Cuba of Fidel Castro and him. And these are some of the Cuban guerrillas. And they were going to fight, they're fighting a, a guerrilla war in the mountains of Cuba, perfect place for a guerrilla war, hit and run tactics. And by the middle of 1890, by the middle of the 1890s, so 93, 94, they were doing quite well. Spain was in, Decline's not a strong enough award. Their kingdom was in free fall. And they're worried they're going to lose their remaining colonies, which their last little bits of prestige, even though it was costing them a lot of money. In fact, their two of their biggest colonies were in the middle of a civil war at that moment, fighting for independence. Cuba, the Philippines. Hmm. Moving on. And so they're going to send General Valerno, he'd be soon dubbed the Butcher, Weiler. He was a German born, or German parents, lived in Spain, and he was basically told, win, knock Cuba Libre out. And they began what's called the reconcentration policy. Basically, this to isolate the guerrillas. They knew civilian Cubans were helping the guerrillas. And so what they were going to do is imprison, so round up Cuban civilians and put them into these camps surrounded by the brand new barbed wire, where they're going to be horribly mistreated within the camp, partially out of pure negligence and incompetence, partially on purpose. <clears throat> but the idea being anybody outside the camp is a gorilla. Here's a story from the New York Herald about starving Cubans within these camps. This is a brutal policy of terror to try to knock out Cuba Libre. A couple years after this, the British would do the same thing in South Africa in a war some of you might have heard of called the Boer War. And they would do almost the same thing against Dutch immigrants in South Africa that the British were trying to dominate so they get the gold and, and diamonds. Set up these camps. Now they didn't call it reconcentration policy, they called them concentration camps. And that's where the term concentration camp comes from. And they were still basically, they, they were using World War One, for example. Have you ever heard of something called like boot camp for soldiers? They, they hastily made a bunch of camps for all the, the volunteers, not volunteers, I'm sorry, all the draftees in World War One to train them really quick in the US Army. And they called them concentration camps in the United States. They didn't have the connotation they're going to have after World War II. But a lot of countries would use this. Another country would use the reconcentration policy, call them concentration camps. The US would do the same thing in the Philippines. But that's coming. So, and then anybody outside, they're a gorilla. And they would either be killed on the spot, or one of the things they would do is they would do the showpiece torture, something called garroting. And garrotting would become uh, like infamous all across the world for the way the Spanish would use this. Garrotting is slow strangulation. Slow strangulation. So they have these chairs. Now, 
This one is is staged for the camera. This one probably is too, but this one we're not 100% sure about. And they would sit him in the chair, except to look like this with this leather strap around, and they would slowly turn this crank that would push their neck into the strap. And you could make this last two days of just slowly strangling something. But if you ever seen, they're usually like a mediocre movies where they have somebody like kill a guard or they use a rope and strangle from behind. That's called garroting too. And they would do these slow, these big, huge public executions within the camps, basically saying, "This is what's going to happen if you help." Them. And this horrible method of terror and execution would become big news in the United States. Stories like this sell newspapers, and this was at the gold. This is the golden age of newspapers. Well, inside the camps was utter hell. A combination of negligence and purposely terrorizing them led to mass starvation. These were pictures that were in American newspapers. And showing the starvation of children. Um, this poor man inside one of the camps, just unbelievable hell. But in the short time, it was relatively effective for the Spanish. By 1897, Cuba Libra had gone to the hills. They weren't getting the help. They felt responsible for the terror. And the German, now it was going to fail in the long run. But going into 1898, the battle had actually kind of worn down. It was not as much fighting, but in the United States, it was still selling newspapers. You remember what the term is for sensationalism in journalism? That's yellow journalism. Yep. And this to sell papers. And the two main purveyors was the established Joseph Pulitzer and his world. There are other newspapers too. There are over 100 daily newspapers in New York City at this time. I know New York City had 4 million people, but you know, people read newspapers. William Randolph Hearst took an inheritance, and we got oil money from Ohio, and would buy the failing journal and turn that into a major competitor. How? He took Pulitzer's use of whatever sensational story like this one. You know, this is front page. Yes, yeah, a tragic story, but really? But this is the kind of thing that they would show. Money gone and alone, she determined to die. Oh, and then baseball scores. Okay, so that was the other thing. Baseball became huge because newspapers are perfect for stats from baseball games. Well, Hearst hired all these reporters to follow police around, look for the most sensational murders. In fact, both of them just went down. Right before this happened, they found basically this torso floating in Hudson Bay. And that became like, the biggest news in New York City for the summer of 1897. And it was like, we got to find more bodies. This is awesome. I mean, the story about local like TV news and, and newspapers, the slogan is, if it bleeds, it leads. Kind of horrible, but that's what they do. Sensational stories. And yes, obviously it still goes on today. Well, oh, I should add Pulitzer, who always wanted to act like he was this great reporter just reporting the news, but he was just involved in yellow journalism at first. He would uh, use an endowment from and down after he died to have the Pulitzer Prize for excellence in journalism. One of the uh, kind of ironic twists. Yeah. They had a giant, uh, like, news, like, news voice had a giant striker. Like, this is like, nice for, for what? Say it again. Is it, wasn't there, like, didn't he have, like, his union have, like, a striker record during, during this time? I don't remember. I, yeah, I'm asking. Yeah. And there was also a strike of newspaper board. That was kind of famous at this yeah, time. Yeah. There's been like three different movies made about this. No, I didn't hear what you first said, but yeah, there's a, yeah. And because uh, they're obviously horribly mistreated, they're full of, you know, those little kids. But here's the thing war sells newspapers. And the term for pro war speech or talk is called jingoism, which, by the way, is a great name. It's too bad they don't use that anymore, you know, the jingoistic report. 
I mean, you see all of us are not right now and what's going on in Ukraine, which we just aren't, aren't sure what's going on. I should add, it could have, um, Russia could invade Ukraine anytime in the next two weeks, and after that, it'll be too late. Mud. When spring hits, it just turns into a quiet mark for two months. So they got, they attacked for two weeks. We'll see. So, yeah. Hmm? Oh, I thought you had a question. So there's Cuban mother, and yeah, this is obviously elements of truth to this, and I guess it's supposed to be a but I like to be vulture on the side. But one of my favorites, this is such a good one. Frederick Remington was the great Western artist. There's a few of his paintings at the Historical Society of like epic cavalry charges. They're, they're that kind of kind of jingoistic. But you know, painters made money by doing these sketches for newspapers. So at the end of 1897, Holzer sent him down said, find me stories, <laughs> find me stuff. And he actually sent back in January of 1898, there's nothing going on in Havana. Cuba Libre hit the hills and there's nothing going on. And Fulcher responded, you provide the pictures, I'll provide the war. Just send me stuff. And so Remington, you can see right here, you see the ton, Remington. This is one of his pictures he sent back that would be front page of the paper. So, Spaniards search women on American steamers, passenger ships. And this is as sensational as you could get. By the way, does it remind you of that hierarchy of race picture of a woman alone, surrounded by leering men? That same kind of thing. It's clearly not only is she being strip shirts, but it's implying something else very horrible is about ready to happen. Did that happen? No, he's made it up. It sounded good. Here there were searches and he thought, I know what he wants. Boom. Made up. But this is front page in the paper. How dare those Spanish? Bad enough with the Cubans, but to Americans. Cubans. So that gives you an idea of what they would sell. And this, Jingoism sells papers. And so, where does the term yellow journalism come from? Well, yellow journalism actually came from an effort by the, by the um, Folgers paper, The World, to have the first colorized comics in a newspaper. And there's this cartoon called Hogan's Alley. And it's all about New York stuff. But the main character, the yellow kid. And since it was the main character of the first real effort to sell papers using color, yellow journalism, which survives to this day, now, I've been trying to figure out for a very long time what this cartoon means. I have no idea. I know all of us, you know, we, we probably all know 1890s New York references, but the crowd gets up for an election bonfire and the yellow kid plays Nero. So, it's supposed to represent Nero, who supposedly played a fiddle, played a lute, while Rome burnt. Emperor Nero. So here's him as Nero. And then all these little New York references. I have no idea. Here's a goat. Here's a parrot. And eh, hot pocket. <laughs> Get it? By the way, what's a hot pocket? It literally was put a match in someone's pocket and lighted on fire. Hilarious. But they have all this stuff going on. I don't have any idea. Okay. And you can see this to this day. Now, they don't sell this newspaper anymore, but they still have the National Enquirer if you go to a store. But I just thought I'd give you two headlines of an example of this goes on today. And I'm still worried about Bad Child is now Bat Boy. And it's coming for you. And this one just made me laugh. Okay, so. Cuba then. What was the U.S. position? The U.S. didn't really have one. McKinley vaguely supported Cuba Libre, Libre. Most people did not want war per se. Marcus Hanna didn't want war. War leads to insecurities of the market. So Russia invades Ukraine. There's already an oil shortage worldwide. It will only get bigger. If there's a shortage of something like oil, which is happening right now worldwide, what happens to prices? Prices will go up more. There's already a shortage. So, yeah, Russia, I don't have no idea what they're doing. 
that they're just stopping at things. So U.S. policy, though, is being pushed and prodded by yellow journalism. So here's another example of this. Remember those pictures I showed you about? They showed Queen Lulu Kalana, or that one where it had the uh, Teddy Roosevelt carrying the Cuban up to the schoolhouse? Well, here is an example of what's going on in Cuba. Anarchy on fire. But what's causing the fire? It's not Spanish misrule. Spanish misrule is just flying Cuba. What's causing the misrule? Let me read what it says. The duty of the hour to save her, not only from Spain, but from a worse fate. So as bad as Spain is, if Spain is gone, what's going to happen to her? Yeah. And who's causing the anarchy? Cubans themselves. Meaning Cuba is not fit to do what? Rule themselves. Yeah. And look how they draw her. It's not the same face but like they show for Queen Lulu Kwan to try to justify that. That's to be sympathetic. Look at the characteristics. Look at the features. You'll see this time after time before the war. After the war, it'll switch. So, with that, But then going in 1898, Dufoy, Dufoy de, de Long was a, de Long was a, the U.S., I'm sorry, the uh, Spanish ambassador to the United States. And he sent a telegram back to Madrid where he was complaining about the inconsistencies in American policy, especially President McKinley. So I have to write the long letter and they just read what the long letter says and they go back to writing. Pretty good. By the way, don't you love this mustache? Yeah, I'm lurking behind you. Yeah. You know what I've ever teacher that made everyone face? Yeah, that was so awful. Yeah, he should sit Somebody's a little paranoid. What's he calling McKinley? I really wish you wash him. Whoever talks to him, he just goes right along with it. Beating he's he's ineffective. And we have the weird situation in the United States where not only is the president the executive, the president's kind of the symbol of the country. And here it's saying that ineffectual. Now, two things about this. First off, this was a private telegram. Somebody working at the Western Union station, which shipped it onto the transcontinental or the transatlantic telegraph line, was working for Hearst. And he stole a copy and first put it in his paper. So it went throughout the country and McKinley was humiliated. And the other part was a lot of Americans are, a lot of Americans criticized McKinley. I already told you they thought he was pretty much an own subsidy of Marcus Hanna. A lot of Americans did. We can criticize our own president. He's our own idiot, but you can't criticize him. They were furious about him. His own undersecretary of the state, uh, secretary, I'm sorry, McKinley's own undersecretary of the Navy, Teddy Roosevelt, said McKinley did not have the backbone of a chocolate eclair. Now, let's be clear about it. They didn't think much of McKinley, but you can't call him that. And now McKinley has got, he has no choice. Especially somebody who is already kind of weak, he's got to look what now? Tough and strong. He doesn't necessarily want war, but he sends the near obsolescence, meaning close to obsolete, battleship, the USS Maine. So it was made in the 1880s, and it was already to the point where it's very near being too old to use. That's how fast technology was changing. So they sent this older ship. 
to Havana Harbor to kind of intimidate the Spanish. And they did a few things like, you must talk, work for independence, we got to protect American interests. Set this old ship down there. And what happened to the main? It blew up. It blew up in Havana Harbor. And who sunk the main? Well, you can imagine what the newspaper said. Here's the journal. Work of an enemy. $50,000 award. Not an accident. And look at this picture. Naval officers think the main was destroyed by a Spanish mine. You see, that's supposed to be an underwater mine. Did they have evidence of this? Who cares? This sells newspapers. Now, let's look at the world. They don't mess around. Caused by bomber explosion, here to be exploding ship, even a sailor flying through the air on fire. To give you an idea how bloody and gruesome this was. All over the United States, Spain blew up the main. Three days later, this cartoon. How can we let them go by? Those evil, cruel Spanish look, Spaniards, look how they draw, as a monster, something to be feared, a brute. No, nobody believes Spaniards look like that. That's not the point. Me saying that, I know it sounds obvious, just to reinforce that idea, push it. Now, McKinley still was very reluctant to go to war because nobody knew why the main blew up. As it turned out, it was almost certainly an explosion in the coal bin. Coal dust is incredibly dangerous in enclosed areas, and all it takes is one spark. It's all it takes. There were these explosions all the time on coal-powered ships or in steam engines. Heck, grain explodes like that in grain mills. Grain dust. Yeah. So uh, do other countries that, like, say, the United States go into stuff, do they have, like, their newspapers and stuff, do they have pictures like this? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, sure. There's sensationalism everywhere, yeah. And so, that became the slogan. Remember the main and the hell of Spain. All over the United States, let's get Spain. Now we're not even sure why anymore. Now they're eventually going to drag the wreckage of the main out in Havana Harbor. The mass that survived is now at Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. And it's still a popular place for people to go scuba diving, I guess, into the wreckage of the main. Has anyone ever scuba dive? You have? You have? Few people have? Did you like it? Yeah. No, you're not claustrophobic. And so, here's... I'm a little claustrophobic. I try to do it a little <laughs> Grip your teeth and do it. Yeah, that's all you can do. Well... With that, this is the, some of the bodies that were brought back. They had a massive procession through New York. Thousands came out, and McKinley's starting to be pushed. But let's be clear about it. Marcus Hanna is going to make the decision. And Hanna was very reluctant at first. And then business interests came to him, especially from the steel industry, and said, you know, this might work out okay. Spain is weak. If we can win fast, Oops. And so Hannah reluctant at first, but then business turned their idea around. It went from insecurity to the market to, if the U.S. gets an empire, we need a bigger fleet, more steel, more ship production. We need more uniforms. We need more weapons. We need food production. Maybe this could be a good thing. This would expand the market. Good thing for business. And McKinley flipped. And in Two months after the main exploded, asked Congress for a declaration of war. Two months afterwards. And, but the papers kept drumming it and drumming it and drumming it, so it wasn't out of people's mind. Here's the journal's headline. It was not unanimous, but most people joined it and immediately called out for troops. So the United States is at war. And what, what, what for? Cuba. It's to protect the Cubans. So what's the first move of the United States? The order would be given by Undersecretary of the, of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt, a young and up-and-coming politician from New York from a very wealthy family. 
He was uh, a Republican from New York, soon to be known as a progressive Republican. He made one big order, then went off to start his own unit. And this should give you everything you need to know. The U.S. has no army, but has a fairly strong navy, at least stronger than the Spanish. And where did he order the first U.S. attack on? Obviously, the Philippines. The U.S. had a naval squadron under Commodore Thomas Dewey based in the British colony of Hong Kong. About 17 ships, modern, and ordered them to attack the filthy. That's the first place. If there's any question about what this war was about, this should tell you everything you need to know. Now, Roosevelt is going to make a big deal. He made the order big deal about it. But clearly, McKinley was for this. So we're coming to the Battle of the Philippines, and Thomas Dewey would be the first big hero. They would sail down, took a little bit over a week, and they arrived in the middle, middle Bay. The Spanish had 17 ships, but they saw most of them iron armor, older guns. The United States had modern rifled guns using the new cordite, the smokeless powder. So they had eight inch guns on some of their ships that could fire 15,000 yards. Now, I want to be very clear about it. They didn't know how to aim them. Not over 99% of the shells the United States Navy fired in the Battle of Manila Bay missed. But the Spanish hit nothing. They were still training like they're firing 100, at something 100 yards. They didn't realize the power of these rocket ships. They would start to realize in the Russo-Japanese War, but World War I was still kind of a surprise. And there's Commodore Dewey as he sails into the Battle of Manila Bay. And as you can see by his countenance, he was somebody... Okay, I was looking for Dewey, and this is the first picture that came up. That's Mickey Rat. Get it? All right. So, the Battle of Manila Bay. And this was as, about as one-sided of a victory as you could imagine. The decrepit, obsolete Spanish flea had no chance. And it wasn't so much that they were destroyed, but they were just run to ground. They had to, they basically had to hide, some were hit, and they just surrendered. Now, the U.S. has no army. And so the Philippines, you know, the United States went up and occupied the Philippines for two months. But the Filipinos declared independence because they thought the Americans were there to liberate them. They're going to be bitterly surprised. So with that, Here's the Dewey smashes Spain's fleet. Dewey's going to become the first real big hero of the world. There'll be songs written about him. This was the golden age of sheet music. So all these really cheesy songs written about him. And big victory. His flagship, the Hartford, is uh, in Philadelphia Harbor. You can go tour the ship. Just a little tidbit that I know. <laughs> You're supposed to go, wow, what a tidbit. Okay. So. But to get support for the war, because a significant number of Americans did not want this war for empire, for various reasons, the Teller Amendment would be added to the Declaration of War. And this said Cuba is going to be independent. It's not a war of conquest. But it never fully said what independence meant. And what about the other places? Like, let me throw one out. The Philippines, perhaps Guam, Puerto Rico, all Spanish colonies. It didn't mention those other areas. It didn't mention the Philippines, which is kind of shocking. Declaration of War, Cuba independent, the first place in the United States attack, the Philippines. Here's another one. Here is supposed to be a play, and it's showing... You're the bad guy in black. We talked about all the colors they would do. There's the American with poofy wrist things. But there's Cuba as the damp shoulder in this dress. And look at her face. Look how they draw her. This is meant to be sympathetic. So, there's another one. Uncle Sam protecting Cuba. And look at her face. This is very important. Propaganda has many different ways. Depending on its evil Spanish. The Spanish wore white uniforms. 
I know that's not good camouflage, but the U.S. still wore navy blue. Modern weapons, you know, are still, you know. After this war, they're gonna, everyone's going to adopt khaki or some color that's a little bit, a little bit easier to hide, except for, of course, the French. The French want to look good and have crazy courage. Yes? Exactly. And look at the way her face is drawn, and we'll show it down the road. Now they drew Queen Lulu Lucalana. It's really important to see it that way. So with that, so the U.S. had to start organizing an army. There are only 28,000 men in the U.S. Army, and most of it's scattered in bases. Almost no one had led an army of any size in the, in the, uh, they were still in the army. The Civil War was the last time they did that. And here you can see many of the men had cotton, navy blue tops, cotton khaki pants. But most of the National Guard soldiers they brought up were still wearing navy, navy blue wool uniforms from the Civil War. In fact, they were still eating hardtack, the crackers from the Civil War. Somebody added an extra zero by mistake. Somehow got to, the, to Montana for their quota. So Montana sent a disproportionate number of troops to the Spanish American War. A lot. Uh, we had a very good rifle invented here called the Craig, a modern bolt action rifle, but it tended to jam in humid weather. I'm sure that won't be a problem. One of those things, I'm not. And then there, we never invested in machine guns. They were still using gap, black powder Gatling guns from the 1860s and 1870s. But fortunately, the Spanish army had better weapons, German Mauser rifles. Their morale was horrible. A lot of the, they still called black soldiers, remember this is a segregated army. They're still called colored regiments, including three were still in Montana, two in Missoula, one in Mile City. They were sent to, um, Tampa. And that's going to lead to what's called the Tampa Riot. So these soldiers got there. The thought was that soldiers of African descent would be more or less susceptible to yellow fever and malaria. I mean, there's an element of truth to the malaria, but yellow fever, not at all. That's what sub Saharan Africans, we talked about that when we got to the slave trip. But a lot of these soldiers, and these are some of the soldiers from the 6th U.S. Infantry Regiment that was based in the Zulu. They assume when they got to Tampa, because they were part of this um, big patriotic effort to attack Spain, they'd be treated as normal, as regular or equal citizens. And so they tried to go into restaurants or bars, taverns, but Florida, what were the laws of segregated in the South? What do they call it? The Jim yeah, those are the Jim Crow laws. Um, they would, many of them were arrested. And they kind of banded together the protests this, and then this is going to lead to a fight between mostly white men of uh, Tampa attacking black soldiers and retaliating. And this is going to be called a race riot. And what's going to happen to many of the black soldiers who were attacked? They're going to be court-martialed. And this was quite a shock, but this was, remember, the most racist time in, in history. Teddy Roosevelt would recruit his own regiment. He doubles the Rough Riders, some cowboys from the plains, dandies from, from wealthy families. And the only reason we know so much about him is that Teddy Roosevelt was already kind of famous, but he was just interesting. He made great quotes, reporters followed him, they sent word back to him, so it's always about Teddy Roosevelt and this kind of slang of Rough Riders. And if you look up Teddy Roosevelt on the internet, you might see pictures like this of him all in buckskin riding up San Juan Hill. So, they were dressed like regular American soldiers. There's Teddy Roosevelt with the blue, navy blue top, and they didn't have horses. They didn't have enough room on the ships, and they were in such a hurry. They just this pell-mell, frantic effort to go invade. They walked, so the cavalry walked. So all this thing about him charging up San Juan Hill, they didn't even charge up San Juan Hill. They're called El Cani. But this all came part of the myth. So the plan was. Havana, too hard to take. The Spanish fleet was here at Santiago. And if they could take that or drive the fleet out, Spain would have to surrender. They got the Atlantic Ocean, the Spanish fleet's uh, obsolete. I mean, the US is just the plan is knock that base out, Spain will sue for peace. Because Spain is already in trouble. So, attack here and also seize the, uh, Puerto Rico. 
So they land it. Here's a very easy to follow map, right? Got it. Everyone good? Everyone happy? Here's Cuba. There's Santiago. They landed here and moved over land. This was such a horrible operation that they didn't have enough boats. So to get the horses they needed for the supply and artillery, they didn't have enough boats. So what did they do? And they put guys with bugles on the beach and hope the horses swam to the bugles. But since most of them were bought relatively new and hadn't been in the army, they didn't know to follow the bugles, so some decided to swim to Venezuela. I, I hope they made it. That's all I'm going to say. But let's just put it this way. It was a disastrous operation. But fortunately, the Spanish were unmotivated. Most of the soldiers were conscripted. They didn't care. There'll be a couple fights, but there's hills around here. The most famous of these hills, we're going to jump right to it, was San Juan Hill. There was a fort on top. The 6th and the 8th U.S. Infantry Regiments took it. Teddy Roosevelt, watching the fight, kind of joined in and charged up alone on, on foot, because he had a horse, with the infantry regiments, and he would take all the credit for it because he was kind of a publicity hound. A major publicity hound. But this picture shows, because it's a watercolor, contemporary. And you see, the Spanish, after the only problem was the Spanish were all in white, so they would have been white. But, do you see the soldiers? This is one of what they call the colored regiments. There was two black regiments who took it, but Teddy Roosevelt got the credit. And when he was asked about it, he said something to the effect that, well, those cowardly soldiers needed me to push him along the way. No, that was not true, but that's, so they did not get the credit, but that shouldn't surprise. By the way, see how they, the backpacks are so uncomfortable, they, the main way to carry is fly, drop your top, your blanket, put your gear in it, tie it around your shoulders. Civil War style. Here's the Citadel after the battle, and this became a postcard that they painted. This gives you an idea of the ferocity of the fighting. But once the U.S. could get guns on top of the hill, the Spanish position was untenable. They didn't want to fight this war anymore. They, their fleet tried to escape. It failed. War over. Happened really fast. Really fast. So Thomas Edison decided to reenact various parts of this battle. He's in New Jersey, and they filmed this, and they would show these in vaudeville theaters. So this, I mean, you're going to feel like, this is feel like you're in Cuba right now. And look at the dramatic cavalry charge. Okay, in 1899, people are like, whoa! It's kind of funny. My assumption is they're fighting somebody. And then while we'll the, uh, let's do it again. And I know you're thinking, isn't that a loop? No, they're going to fire twice. And they also reenacted the naval battle where they got big wash tub. And they have boats and they put firecrackers on them and they blow them. All this kind of stuff. And then the cavalry charge. There was no cavalry. So New Jersey was the motion picture capital. And I know what you're thinking. You want to see more, right? Here's another film from 1899. Remember if Congress saves all these. Of cats boxing. And you notice cats are pretty tough, but they don't keep their laptop, right? Rule one of boxing, keep your laptop. I know the cats would really like to get this guy, but, all right. Secretary of State John Hay would call this a beautiful mountain valley. And the thing is, how's that for quickness, huh? Yeah. A splendid little war. Just a few thousand died. Only 385 combat deaths for the United States, 800 for the Spanish. But look how many died in this use. You don't need to know the exact numbers. 15,000 Spaniards died. But the point is, so many more died of disease. This is actually really common in the war. But we're skipping out. Yellow fever and malaria. But what else killed lots of them? Food poisoning. 
these big food processors, these big companies got all these contracts for food. And they started, you know, canned food was seen as a big boom for soldiers. But the problem with canned food is you don't know what you're getting. During the panic of 1893, and during the depression that happened in the next four or five years, see you tomorrow. No, uh, you're not going to be here tomorrow, right? Okay, well, if not, we'll see you tomorrow. They were just putting this food in these big slaughterhouses and just putting them in the basement, not refrigerated, just meat, intestine, bone, just kind of sticking them down there. And they were, in fact, in the jungle, in that reading really, you have, they called them petrified meat. They're kind of becoming gray, and you can imagine all the other stuff. Also, they got all these contracts. Said, we got all this stuff down here. They took it out, put it in the hopper, they ground it up. And why didn't they have gravy with it? Food in cans. You can't see it, you can't smell it. This is the first time large numbers of people were eating the same kind of food, their canned processed food for every meal. And what was happening? A significant number were getting food poisoning, and that might, some did die from that, or weaken them. There's a story of, an Ameri of a Montana National Guardsman. I'll just say real quick as you get your stuff ready. Stick a spoon into a can of bully beef, this kind of old steer, ground up steer. Very quick. Start digging out a horseshoe nail. Meaning they should be grinding up the whole horse, not just and not leave the nails. I think you get the point. See, on that note, yeah, you're welcome for that story. Wait till Wednesday. Master. <laughs> See you tomorrow. I'm going to shut the camera off.